Welcome into the program this morning. Great to be with you. Thank you so much for choosing to be with us. You're listening to Tactics. I am Caleb Colquitt. As always, great to be with you on this Thursday. Now, unfortunately, do have some bad news. Not going to be with you for the full hour today. In fact, I'm probably going to have to wrap this up probably in about 20, 25 minutes. And the reason for that is I have a previous engagement. I've already made a promise. I'm going to go speak to some of the students a journalism class at Alabama Christian Academy, and so I will have to be moseying my way out the door right before that takes place. I need to give myself time to uh, make sure the studio is ready for everybody else, and, and so because of that, won't be here for the full hour, but we are going to hit hard while we are here and make the most of the time that we do have together. So thank you so much for being a part of the program, 860-1440, if you do want to call in and let me know what is on your mind. So quite a few stories happening today. I think probably the biggest one is that the president has essentially, I don't want to say capitulated, but it feels like a capitulation when it comes to the government shutdown and the State of the Union. Now, he hasn't caved on the shutdown, even though I'm afraid that that may be nigh. But nonetheless, you may know, we talked about it a couple days ago, that Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, basically disinvited Donald Trump to speak in the House when it comes to the State of the Union because of the shutdown, which is ridiculous on a number of levels. First of all, she extended that invitation on January 3rd, which was well after the government shutdown. So the idea that the government shutdown had something to do with it is just ridiculous. And... The Department of Homeland Security director was actually addressed about this, and she said, yeah, that there should be no problem with security. There should be no problem with funding. The only reason that Nancy Pelosi did not want the State of the Union to happen is because, A, she does not want the president to have a direct line to and, and a big platform, a big stage like that before the shutdown ends. She does not want the president to have that, and it's just a petty, childish thing. Now... <laughs> Donald Trump grounding her as a response to that was hysterical. But even though Trump's usually somebody that really likes to fight back, it's really strange that he has decided that he is not going to do the State of the Union until after the shutdown is over. I find that odd because there were several suggestions, including some coming from yours truly, on how the president should handle this. And one of the things that I mentioned, and I thought that it was actually a really good idea, that what the president should have done is as soon as Nancy Pelosi, and I know you can't go back in time and change this now, but as soon as Nancy Pelosi disinvited him and made this big hoopla about it and all in the media were, were plastering it all over the front page and the top story of everything, Trump's reaction should have been incredibly muted. In other words, what Trump should have done is come out and be like, that's fine. Because that would have drove Nancy Pelosi up a wall. When you go out of your way specifically to troll somebody and do something just to make them mad just because you know that they're not going to like it, the most fur infuriating thing that they can do is act like it just really doesn't bother them. And the truth is we don't need the State of the Union, at least not in the form as it exists today. Because the majority of our presidents have delivered the State of the Union in letter form. That's how Washington did it. That's how Lincoln did it. That's how every single president did it up until Woodrow Wilson, who wanted to add all the pomp and circumstance and the dog and pony show that the State of the Union is now. And that's essentially what it's become. And anybody that's honest about it will say that. And I've been critical of the State of the Union, at least the way that it exists in our present sense now, because it just it reeks of the monarchy. It reeks of the king going to parliament to address and basically dictate to them exactly what his plans are for the future. And I just, I just, I detest that. It feels more like something that would happen in a dictatorship or in a monarchy than a constitutional republic. And that's one of the reasons that I dislike it as much as I do. But nonetheless, that is a possible response. He could have gone and done what Del Jackson, our friend up in Huntsville, who's also a cumulus host, what he suggested, which is to have it out in the middle of the desert or done what Mo Brooks suggested and actually go and have it in the Senate. It would have been a smaller venue, but it still would have been a really big crowd. They can still seat quite a bit, uh, quite a few people. And so 
that would have been one way to handle it. There were several other options that the president had, but this one I think is probably the worst out of all those options because not having it at all, I think does send a message and sends a strong message. And if he played it right, it could have been, I think, and this is the reason that I suggested it, the strongest, the strongest message of all. But I don't know the, the way that the president is reacting now saying that I tell you what, we'll just do it after the shutdown I don't know if this is actually a capitulation, but it feels like Nancy Pelosi won this round, which is a darn shame because him grounding her was one of the most hilarious events that we've had, certainly of 2019. But I think you could go back in his entire presidency. It was one of the most entertaining things the president has done. So I do hate that. I do hate that he's kind of, I don't want to say caved, but certainly he's not doing his usual Trump thing. And that's one thing that I am a little bit upset about. Normally, it makes me nervous when he does his usual Trump thing. In fact, most of the time I'm critical of it. But, you know, this is one time where I feel like stepping up to the plate a little more would have been beneficial politically for him. And I don't think that that's the case. I, I don't know. It just seems like a bad move to me. I don't think it's detrimental. I don't think it's going to hurt his approval ratings or anything like that. I just would have liked to have seen this play out differently. But nonetheless, we do have other news to get to. And one thing that I wanted to address as well is this Covington story. And the reason that I think that this is so incredibly important is because this is one of those incredibly rare times that the media is lying to us and we have evidence of the media lying to us and we have a mountain of evidence that is readily available to the public that the media is absolutely lying to us because the media lies to us all the time. And we point this out all the time on this program. But normally there is a kernel of truth to it or it's just something that was that they're taking out of context or skewing a certain way or there's – it's a story to where if you want to find out the truth, you have to dig pretty deep or you have to take it on the word of, of eyewitness accounts or something like that. This is something that the American public, anybody, can go and find this video, this two-hour-long video – and watch with their own eyes and get their own context and be able to see that there's this story is the opposite of the way the media is trying to present it. The exact opposite. And yet, the media continues to try to hang on to this narrative that these are a bunch of evil, white, racist, MAGA hat wearing, private school Catholic boys. And they hate this guy and they hate people of color. They hate any kind of minority, and that's the reason that they were accosting this guy, which is not true. I mean, anybody watching the video, and especially if you watch the video in its full context and see what happened to the lead-up of that, shows that out of the three groups there, the black Hebrew Israelites, the Native American groups there, and the boys from Covington School, oddly enough, despite being a bunch of kids, they acted more maturely, and they acted with more charity than any of the other groups there. Certainly more than the black Hebrew Israelites, but also more than the Native Americans, which you got Nathan Phillips going up there, knowing that the story is a bald-faced lie, and just saying lie after lie after lie after lie, just so he can boost his own political agenda. And it's absolutely despicable. And I think a lot of Americans are looking at this and saying, well, if my kid were in that situation, I would hope that they acted that way. I would hope that they acted the way that these kids did. That just tried to do their own thing, and they were the ones actually trying to drown out the racist drivel that was coming out of the black Hebrew Israelites. And then the Native Americans come up. They think that the Native Americans, because they've been harassed by these guys all day, they think the Native Americans are actually showing up and drumming to try to help them drown these guys out and they're excited about it. They're glad to be there. And they were chanting first. The drums started later and started matching them and their chants. That's what they think is going on. And so anybody that I think is fair minded and watches this thing looks at these groups and says, okay, there's two villains and one hero. And the one that is the hero is the only one that is getting ridicule for this. And so this is the reason that I think that this is such an important story, because it has really become the American people versus the media. And the problem with that is that the media now, 
continues to hang on to this narrative because they were just salivating. They were chomping at the bit to be able to do a story about a bunch of quote unquote white privileged MAGA hat wearing private Christian Catholic boys. Uh, being disrespectful to a Native American who's also a veteran. And by the way, the veteran thing is half true. You remember we talked about this on the program yesterday. His veteran status had been called into question. He did serve with the United States Marine Corps. However, he was never deployed to Vietnam. He never saw combat. Doesn't take away from his service. We still thank veterans for their service regardless of where they served. But let's also put into perspective this is not somebody that saw combat. This is not somebody that was deployed overseas. And so let's just keep that in mind. Not trying to degrade the man, not trying to say that his service isn't appreciated. I'm just saying, let's put it in its proper perspective. But nonetheless, this is the narrative that you see going on, that you see playing out before your eyes, and the media is telling you the exact opposite of what your own eyes and your own ears are telling you. And despite the fact that they've been proven wrong, the vast majority of the media... I'm seeing it from CNN and MSNBC, Huffington Post. I mean, all the typical left-leaning news sources are coming out and trying so hard to just grab onto and hang on to the original narrative, even though every piece of evidence shows that they're completely wrong. And you saw that really in the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, and I think the media is yet again completely overplaying its hand. And it's going to wind up hurting them and hurting their cause in the end, which actually... Maybe a good thing. In fact, I think when it came to the Kavanaugh thing, that's the reason that the elections did not go far worse for the Republicans. And so if the media continues to push their lies and overplay their hand this way, even though the evidence clearly points in the opposite direction, I think that's a win for the American people. I think that's a win for the Republicans, and I think that's a win for the country. And they did this Today Show interview with this kid. They did a Today Show interview that was specifically custom designed to try to get the kid to admit. And somebody who's trained as a journalist, somebody that pays attention to this stuff, you can tell that that journalist had it made up in her mind before this ever started that this kid was guilty, this kid was in the wrong. And she asked him the same question over and over again. You see this happen when they'll interview politicians, when they interview people that are in the media and actually know this stuff. And even then, it's very hard for somebody in the media, it would be hard for me to be able to give exactly the same answer every time and to remain consistent and not slip up with a word or something like that. And you'll notice that when this happened, because I think three or four times she asked this question and just worded it a different way. So it sounded like a different one. Um, she asked this question about how would he do anything differently or uh, and you'll notice that one thing that happened is he said, I wish we could have walked away. I wish there was an outlet. I wish there was some way that we could have left from where we were because they were where they were supposed to be waiting on the bus. They were kind of backed up against the Lincoln Memorial, and so there wasn't a way for them to, to move on that. And so he's saying, I wish that in retrospect we could have walked away. There was one time where he accidentally said, I wish that we would have walked away. And out of the three or four times he said it, you know that the, you'll notice that the one that all the headlines are sprawling today is that I wish we would have walked away. Because that's darn close to an admission of guilt. That's darn close to an admission of wrongdoing, and they know that, and that's the reason they cherry-picked that answer out of all the others. And you can tell the questions are designed in such a way that they were specifically made to try to entrap the guy because they were asking about uh, whether or not he would issue an apology. And that's a question that no matter how you answer it, you are not going to come out of that okay when you have the media pouncing on you like a like a, a herd of or a pride of lions, and here's the reason: if they ask, "Do you think that you need to issue an apology?" If he says no, they run with the headline of, "See, this kid has no remorse, no sympathy, no compassion coming from this guy. He obviously just hates this man." If he says yes, see, he admitted to wrongdoing. He actually did hate this guy. He actually was a racist. He was smirking because he was trying to be disrespectful. See, it doesn't matter how you answer. They're going to assume that you're wrong, and they're going to try to go after you, and that's what is so disgusting about what the media is doing right now. That's the reason that what they're doing is so incredibly evil and the reason they're trying to chastise this guy, and they don't seem to really care that there are death threats and evil people, and, and this happens on both sides. I'm not saying that it doesn't. I'm not saying that there aren't crazy people 
that threaten people on the left. And, and I know that that happens. I'm not trying to say that it's OK. I'm not trying to justify it on either side. But what I am saying is the media is completely flippant and doesn't care about that angle of it. This is a school that had to shut down a couple of basketball games and shut down the school itself because there were crazy people calling and saying they were going to blow up the school. That's how insane this story has gone, even though all they did was stand there and try to keep the peace. And so that's why I think that this is so incredibly important, because here's what happened. The media has engaged in narrative crafting when it comes to this story. In other words, they saw a story. They saw a story that they wanted to tell. And because it was a story that they wanted to tell it, they jumped on it immediately and presented it as though it was the only evidence you needed. We read from it the other day. I mean, that Detroit Free Press piece that we put out, I mean, they had – the jury was already done. They had already decided the hay was in the barn. These kids were in the wrong. This guy, Nathan Phillips, is the victim. Somehow, miraculously, both the victim and the hero of the story and these kids, they were the ones that the, – uh, I believe that the word it used was predators, and these guys were their prey. I mean, just absolutely despicable stuff coming out of the press. But the press did decide because these kids were wearing MAGA hats. I mean, you could not have custom crafted a story. You could not have written and made up a story fictitiously that would have fit the mold of the story that they wanted to tell, especially in the wake of the March for Life. More so than the way that this story played out in their mind, the original narrative that they put out there. And when that narrative got destroyed, they wanted so badly to hang on to it. They wanted so badly for it to be true that they basically just made it true. They made it to where everything that they said, everything that came out, supported the narrative that they wanted to be true. See, instead of following the facts where they led and reporting on that, they did the opposite. They decided where they wanted the facts to go and then tried to back up their story. And they've, they've sort of rebranded the story several times because you also had – they said the other day – there were several stories coming out about this, about um, kids at Covington – flashing white power uh, signals at a basketball game. Well, first of all, that is a widely known signal for a three-pointer. It's a <laughs> it's a basketball game. It's also a widely known symbol for the state of Oklahoma. And the symbol is is like this. It's a uh, you know, it's the okay thing. Uh Buckwheat used to do it a lot on Little Rascals if you're familiar with that show. So, um the, they're saying now that that is a symbol of white power, but if you look at the origins of that, do you know where that comes from? An internet hoax from 4chan. I'm not kidding. You can look this up, and it was an article not by a conservative news site, by Vox.com about the origins of the quote-unquote white power symbol. Vox.com is a very far-leaning left organization, and even they were saying, no, th this thing's not a white power symbol. That was an internet joke that started back in 2016. There there's nothing to that. And so they couldn't figure out a way to make the Catholic school itself racist. And so then they went after a different school that happens to be under the same diocese that's controlled by the Catholic Church. And they tried to go after this kid that they were saying that there was this gay kid that uh, was not allowed to give his speech at graduation or something like that. And it turns out it's not even the same school. It's not even Covington. It's just a different school near that Catholic school. You have lost your mind. They have gone so crazy trying to prove that they were initially right that they have completely lost all sense of logic and reason. They want so, so much for this story to be proven correct that they're willing to accuse other schools of terrible things. And by the way, if you're looking at it, the speech itself did not conform to the standards. It had nothing to do with this kid, uh, this gay kid that they said that they weren't allowed to speak. His speech did not conform to the standards that would have been held for any other person, gay or straight. They had a standard. He didn't meet it. And he also failed to report the speech and, and give the manuscript of the speech in time. And so it's just absolutely ridiculous the links that the media has tried to go through to prove them right because they decided what the facts were before ever looking into it and just said, screw the evidence, screw doing any research. We want the story to be true. Ergo, we're going to figure out a way to make it true. They're doing the opposite of what the media is actually supposed to be doing. All right, so one other thing, we're going to go ahead and go to the Daily Dose of Stupid. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. 
Now, today's Daily Dose of Stupid, once again, has to do with Chick-fil-A. So here's what's going on. Uh, Chick-fil-A, and we know that Chick-fil-A tends to be a favorite target of the left these days. So there's this group called Athens Earth Strike, which you have to admit, whether you like the guys or not, and politically, I'm guessing I would agree with almost nothing that they're doing. Athens Earth Strike, pretty kick-butt name. Like, that's a, a pretty good name. I'm not going to lie. The, uh, the Athens Earth Strike, it just seems to me like that would have been something that I would have gone with. Uh, but they have come out very strong against Chick-fil-A being on the University of Georgia's campus. Now, I don't like to give credit to Georgia for really anything. And I'm not talking about the state of Georgia. I'm talking specifically about the university. I'm an Auburn guy, Georgia versus Auburn, South, South's oldest rivalry. So you can imagine I don't like coming to the defense of Georgia. But I believe that this story is important enough that I kind of have to. And the University of Georgia has had Chick-fil-A on their campus for a long time. It's been something that's longstanding, and it looks like they have no intention of just going along to get along and caving to the demands of these insane people. So Athens Earth Strike is this environmental group, and they're saying that they should uh, Chick-fil-A should be banished from all of University of Georgia's campuses. And here is their rationale. And I use the word rationale very loosely when talking about this. So here's their quote. The industrial white supremacist imperialist capitalist cults of Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Seriously, somehow Chick-fil-A is white supremacist. Now, granted, I have seen them advertising, and, and I think they may have a point here. I have seen them advertising that they only use in their chicken nuggets white meat chicken, which would suggest that they believe that white meat is superior to dark meat. I think they may be onto something. I think that Chick-fil-A may actually be white supremacist. They got a point there. How do they come up with these things? I mean, industrial, well, they are part of the fast food industry. So, yeah, they're industrial, just like literally every other restaurant on earth. They would be industrial, yes. Uh, so, industrial, right, white supremacist, uh, imp imperialist. How are they imperialist? Is Chick-fil-A going conquering other countries? Did I miss that in the news somewhere that did did, uh, did Chick-fil-A, I don't know, invade Spain while I was not looking if they just uh, if they've been conquering other nations and I haven't. It, that's escaped my notice somehow. Anyway, so they call it a capitalist cult. Well, you know, they are capitalists, just like, again, all other businesses. So uh, of Chick-fil-A and the Georgia poultry farms as a whole exemplify violence. The group added to campus reform. One of the major poultry suppliers for Chick-fil-A is Coke. Coke targets the most vulnerable per people in our immigrant communities to work as employees. Uh, factories are built in low-income communities of color. Hmm. Now, I'm not saying that that actually takes place, because I don't know, I haven't done my, my research on that particularly, but let's just pretend that it is for the moment and actually go with this argument, just for the sake of argument. What would solve the problem of a company exploiting illegal immigrants for labor. Oh yeah, stopping illegal immigration. If you want to stop companies, if you believe that companies are bad or evil and that they're just, and by the way, this does happen. I'm not saying that it doesn't. If you're thinking that these companies are all just bad and evil and it's terrible that they exploit labor and they do. And I talked about that this morning on the radio on Kevin's show. If you really think that, you know what you should be really in favor of? A border wall and border security. And stopping the tide of illegal immigrants coming across our borders. If you think that that's wrong, if you think them exploiting them because they don't have records, they don't have any standing when it comes to the United States, if you want that to go away, you know what you should be really in favor of? Border security. And so it is hilarious to me that there is this, uh, there's a contradiction in the left's ideology there. So they, they also say that these jobs are demoralizing. Yeah, we're working on a poultry farm is not demoralizing. I've never actually worked on a poultry farm. That's one area of agriculture that I've not really delved into much, but I've done farm work since I was a child. It's not demoralizing. It is good, honest, hard work. And the idea that it's somehow demoralizing or demeaning, see, these kids wouldn't get their hands dirty. These kids, you wouldn't find them with dirt under their fingernails. 
that's too that's that job in their mind is below them. And so that's why they're saying, well, these jobs are demoralizing. Like I'd ever actually touch an animal. No, this is not a demoralizing job. This is a job that provides, a, I mean, it's a billion dollar industry in the state of Alabama alone. And so I just hate the arrogant, smug attitude of these liberal kids. They're saying that these jobs are difficult and pollute the environment around them for leaving communities even worse in living conditions. There are several communities in Georgia and Alabama and across the southeast that only exist because of the poultry industry. They bring in jobs, they bring in money, they bring in uh, revenue of other kinds, human capital, that kind of thing. And those communities exist and revolve around the poultry industry. Families are able to feed themselves, put food on the table, and by the way, food on your table, thank you very much, because of the poultry industry and other ag industries. In fact, if we did not have ag industries, we would not have any other industries because people got to eat. You remember that back, if you're looking through world history, the reason that we did not have many of the industries that we have now, like electronics, because that technology didn't exist, because people didn't have time to invent those technologies because they were so worried about feeding themselves. Back when you had anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of the world's population directly in production agriculture, you didn't have a whole lot of time to sit around trying to invent new things. Because you were worried about feeding yourself. The fact that our ag industry is the best in the world is the reason that we are on top economically and from a technological standpoint. Because we have the ability, because we spend so much less of our income on our food than we have been in the past, we're able to spend it in other places. And that has created the very lifestyle that we have here. So Earthstrike uh, also said that this is... You want to know how I know these people are a bunch of idiots? This is their demands. No longer use styrofoam cups. Yeah, Chick-fil-A does use styrofoam cups. And you know what else they have? They have giant bins where you can go and recycle those styrofoam cups. You can actually go to their recyc recycling center and you can see that they put together these park benches, which they donate free of charge to parks all across America. They're one of the most environmentally conscious companies that there are. Let's look at their other demand. Keep promise to shift to hormone-free chicken. Again, this is how I know these guys are morons. It's against federal crime. It's against federal law to inject chickens with hormones. No chicken has hormones. If you're going to the market and you see chickens that it says hormone-free, yeah, that's just like all the other chickens that don't have those markings. See, this is people that are talking about the industry that they know nothing about. This is where having an ag degree comes in handy. And also in factory farming. What is factory farming? See, this is the thing that I've never been able to get a good answer from when it comes to environmentalists. They'll say, we have to get rid of factory farming. What is factory farming? Can you define it for me? Nobody can give me a good definition for it, yet they want to ban it. Well, I don't know what it is, but I don't want it I don't want it to be there. I don't want it to exist. Can't figure out whether or not it's actually good or not. Can't even figure out what it is. I know I just don't like it. It sounds bad. And that's the problem. This whole thing from beginning to end is based on feelings, not information, not facts. They also said we demand that UGA stop supporting the corporation that is actively practices both gender discrimination and LGBT discrimination. How do they do that? Is it because they don't serve gay people in their store? Oh, wait, they do. Is it because they don't hire people that are gay? Oh, well, wait, wait, they, they actually do that too. Is it because they don't feed people when they do, and Chick-fil-A is famous for this, whenever there's a natural disaster or something like that, is that because when they give out free food to disaster relief victims that they don't give it to gay people? Oh, no, no, wait, they, they don't do that either. They just pass it out to whoever shows up. How are they discriminating against gay people? Can anybody actually explain to me how that is taking place? Because so far, I've yet to get an answer for that. But that really does go back to, that's what this all boils down to. They don't like the fact that the CEO of Chick-fil-A, the former CEO, because he's now passed, may he rest in peace, you know, he's no longer with us. But because he and his family, who run the company, believe that marriage should be between a man and a woman because that's what the Bible says, 
somehow, even though that actually doesn't play into Chick-fil-A's business practices at all, somehow that makes the whole company tainted, and because of that, we have to hate them. That doesn't make any sense. But again, when you're operating on feelings, making sense really isn't a concern of yours. All right, it looks like I've already stayed past my time, so we're going to have to wrap it up for today. I, I hate that we didn't get to the chaplain's report. Uh, believe me, we're going to have a full show tomorrow, I promise. I don't have any prior engagement, so, uh, you know, barring some kind of natural disaster or something crazy like that, we will have a full show tomorrow, I promise. I will see you then. Thank you so much for your time. Stay the course, friends.